is one of the short sayings of the Desert Fathers. It uh, picks up our theme of these days, the theme of the cell. In Sketis, a brother went to Moses to ask for advice. And he said to him, go and sit in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. Go and sit in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. So a cell can be a place of uh, imprisonment, a place of uh, horror, a nightmare place which we can't get out of. Somebody's locked us in, some unknown force has locked us in and thrown away the key. We may find ourselves in the cell with some mass murderer or some monster that we don't want to be with. Or we may find ourselves in that cell in a terrible loneliness, isolation and where everybody seems to have forgotten us. But the cell has another meaning. The cell is a place where we are at home, where we long to go back to, as to our, our true home, where we can be ourselves, where we can be refreshed and renewed after the labours of the day, where we can regroup our personality after we have been working or performing or acting in diverse ways. We can go back to the cell and show these uh, diverse manifestations of our energy and just regroup all, all these energies back into their center. And it's this understanding of the cell, of course, that uh, the desert and the um, fathers and the Celtic monks understood, although uh, with, some, with some differences of geography. Um, And we have to ask ourselves, in what way does this idea of the cell as a place which will teach us everything, a place of self-knowledge, a place where we can uh, develop and deepen our integrity, our wholeness, how does this relate to the Gospel? Where is the cell in the uh, Gospel teaching of Jesus? We have very slight glimpses of uh, Jesus having a home, uh, born in a manger, uh, went into exile immediately afterwards, and um, came back to Nazareth and grew up there, and then left Nazareth and became an itinerant a preacher and seemed to have had a base in Capernaum but uh, after after he had found his mission, his work he didn't seem to have a uh, what we would normally call a home and so where is the cell in this uh, model of Jesus, the teacher, um, who called people to follow him, um, but warned them that they would not have a place to lay their head. Foxes have, what is it, foxes have their holes, and, hmm? their holes, and every, every, everything normal normally has a, a place to go. <coughs> those who follow him don't. So there's a, there seems to be a, a contrast here uh, between our need 
for not just a physical home and shelter, and, uh, but a, to have a, to have the cell, and at the same time to be detached. This need for detachment um, was expressed vividly in the Celtic monks. Uh, commitment to exile, to voluntary exile, getting into a, a little coracle boat and uh, just pushing off from shore and letting the tides take them where they where they would where they would. So where is this? What does this contrast between uh, rootedness and and detachment? What, what, what does that tell us about our own journey? These seem to be two contradictory spiritual truths. And whenever you come across two contradictory truths, you know you are on the scent of, of something real and some deeper insight uh, because you're moving into a, this tension between these two opposite truths. You are in a paradox and it's in paradox that true insight uh, or wisdom is born. So, a, a cell, uh, as the Desert Fathers uh, understood it, and as the Celtic monks under, understood it in those beautiful poems where they describe their hermitages, uh, which they love, they fell in love with those uh, remote and solitary huts, and um, we read some of those poems uh, a couple of days ago. Um, so the cell, in that uh, um, understanding, is a, is a physical place. We need um, we need some physical manifestation of the heart. So is clearly a symbol of the heart, the place of wholeness, integrity, the place of where we are truly ourselves, where the true self can be recovered, and the place where the true self can bathe us in its radiance and in its healing aura. Um, so that is the heart. And the heart itself is simply a physical symbol of this uh, <coughs> spiritual center, of the spiritual energy. Mm. But uh, everything in our experience, of human experience, calls for some incarnation, some physical manifestation of an inward reality. Our way of knowing the truth is sacramental. Thomas Aquinas says we only know God through metaphor, through symbol. So, in uh, in um, in this uh, symbol of the cell, we have to take account both of the the non-physical spiritual reality and also the, the the need and the natural need for a physical manifestation of the cell stability and also a place of solitude solitude meaning not isolation the Celtic monks loved solitude and the desert fathers went into the desert to find solitude but they were always talking to people and always um, gathering and talking about solitude with other people so the, the solitude is not does require a certain amount of withdrawal from the marketplace at least periodically Jesus himself went regularly into quiet places at quiet times the early morning or so to, to pray alone or alone in the company of his disciples as we're told so solitude does require a certain amount of physical withdrawal from time to time as times of retreat for example or when you're meditating at home and uh, you say to your family, you know, I'm going to meditate now, or um, so just um, put 
potatoes on and um, meditate while they're boiling. Uh, or you put the children into the freezer and keep them <laughs> half an hour. And, uh, and then I'll, when, I, when I finish my meditation, I'll be back and I'll be much, be much uh, better company uh, yeah. after the meditation. So, uh, and then you go in and you close the door of your bedroom or your room. So, uh, solitude does require a certain amount of withdrawal, controlled withdrawal, and maybe psychologically uh, some people need more than others. But um, essentially solitude is about uh, embracing, accepting, recognizing our uniqueness. And that always, that is, that is what the cell uh, allows us to do. It's the experience and the place where we overcome the fear of ourselves, the fear of being who we are, and we find the courage and the peace to, to let go of the, um, the distortions or the false selves that uh, accumulate around us uh, through the expectations of others or through our codependency or through our um, desire to please others, to perform roles that other people want us to play. Um, so these are, this, this is the, the material of the false self or the false <coughs> selves and in the cell, uh, which is always the true self, these false or attached, you know, falsely attached uh, identities uh, can be dropped. And it takes courage to do that because it, we may have identified uh, very strongly with these roles or these images or these expectations or this idea of success or this idea of popularity or this idea of acceptability that what makes us lovable is because we are this or that or what makes us uh, powerful or what makes us likable so it uh, takes some courage to to drop uh, and we don't perhaps know what it is we're going to drop until we start to sit in the cell. Uh, but the cell will teach you. It will teach you everything. The teacher is the true self. And Jesus, the teacher within, is, uh, is not giving you information. He's not giving you the answers which we look up at the back of the book easy. But what the teacher manifested does is uh, lead us and gives us the courage, the encouragement, the uh, motivation to, uh, to sit in our cell and to learn directly from the true self. Um, and the true teacher is always doing that, pointing beyond himself or herself to this experience of the true self. In which, in a mysterious way, we meet the teacher in a transformed and transfigured uh, awareness. So the relationship with the teacher, with Jesus, is a real relationship. Um, but even that relationship we have to be detached from, not reject, not walk away from, not run away from, but we have to be detached from it. Do not cling to me, Jesus says, so that we, we can be led uh, into this <coughs> redemptive, transforming experience of the true self. That's what Jesus wants, when he asks us the question, who do you say I am? 
he is not um, asking for an orthodox catechism answer. He's putting us, if we want to listen to the question, he's putting us on a path of obedience. The word listening and obedience are related. The more deeply we listen, the more deeply obedient we become. And he's putting us on this path. Uh, and if we listen to the question, uh, it will lead us, uh, incidentally, it will lead us to an understanding of who Jesus is, although that's, that's a powerful experience. But the, his intention, it seems to me, is to lead us into this experience of the self, or which has this boundless uh, aspect which we call the Father, or the source of being, that he himself knew and wanted us to know for ourselves. Father John uh, reflects this uh, characteristic of any true teacher when he says that uh, he encourages us actually to meditate, not just read about it. And then he says, in meditation, you will find that you can verify <coughs> the truths of your faith in your own experience. And that phrase, in your own experience, is one of his catchphrases. And any true teacher just wants the student or the disciple to, to see it, to get it, to experience it uh, for themselves. And then that's what makes a good disciple into uh, a teacher. So this is the, this is the cell, then. It's, it's the uh, experience of solitude um, arrived at through the shedding of our false selves. But when we say false self, we shouldn't see that as a guilty um, uh, accusation. Uh, the false selves grow up around us um, or pile up like dust uh, without our knowing it, usually. And uh, the attachment to our false selves uh, is um, not something that we, we choose, something that happens. So although the cell is a place of stability and a place of self-knowledge, it is also a place of hospitality. In the desert uh, tradition and in the Celtic tradition, um, the hermit uh, living in his cell, his cottage or his cave, uh, is always giving hospitality to people. People are always knocking on the, on the door. And this openness to others is a characteristic of true selfhood. The, uh, the cell is not a place of imprisonment, it is a place of openness. This is very much reflected in the culture of the Celtic monastery, where the cloister, or the inside of the monastery, or the little village, which is what it probably was, was seen as a place where the world could come into and be reconnected uh, to itself. It wasn't a place that was filtering out the world or pushing or escaping the world. It was a place to which um, the outside visitor could come and find what they were looking for. And this is again expressed strongly in the Celtic mystical uh, symbol of the stranger. Christ comes to us uh, very frequently in the form of a stranger. And this is what makes life continually interesting and surprising and shocking sometimes. And this is reflected again in the rule of St. Benedict, a different kind of culture of monasticism where he says, every guest, this is, he said, a monastery will never be without guests. Um, and, the, and the guest must always be received as Christ himself. 
there's a direct link there with the Celtic uh, recognition of Christ in the stranger. So the cell is also a place of learning. Go in your go back to your cell and sit there, be stable there, be rooted there, continue your practice there. And <coughs> sit there like Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Be grounded. Uh, and the cell, this this place of stability and of hospitality will teach you everything. It's a big, uh, it's a big uh, statement, really. It will teach you everything. And everything, in this context, usually sends us back to the idea of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is all. God is all in all. And the kingdom is this experience of the uh, comprehensiveness of, uh, of God. <coughs> so there are layers of meaning in this idea of the cell. It's, it's, it refers to your practice, let's say to your meditation. Are you sitting in your practice? In your practice may be sitting in meditation, but are you are you sitting in practice? <coughs> How, you know, to sit is to stay, it is to be grounded, it is to be at ease in your practice. Uh, in most, uh, I think, in all traditions, sitting is seen as the natural position, physical position for, uh, for meditation. Although in the early church, <coughs> they, uh, they prayed with their arms standing, uh, with their arms outstretched. But the, um, for the contemplative uh, times of prayer, uh, sitting is the natural and the universal posture because, uh, as Saint Bernard says, it's halfway between lying down and standing up. When you're lying down, you're going to, you know, you're, you're very close to falling asleep. When you're standing up, you're about to start walking or being active. So sitting is, uh, is a, an alert state of relaxation or a relaxed state of alertness. So your posture you know, incarnates this, um, this mental psychological <coughs> attitude towards your practice. So to sit in your practice, to sit in your cell, if your cell is your practice, to sit in your practice means uh, to do it, to have, um, to have a stability, a regularity. Stability, if st stability is not um, a deep freeze, uh, it's not uh, rigidity, it's not immobility, so much as regularity. If something is alive and stable, it means it has a rhythm, has a regular beat, and there's a, there's a dynamism in that stability. What about kneeling? Hmm? Kneeling. Well, kneeling is a good, yes. And in fact, you know, if you're, you said if you're kneeling with a, a prayer stool, mm. it's a very nice uh, uh, position, actually, if, you, if, you, if you're comfortable with it, your knees. <coughs> Your knees. We don't have any <coughs> press tools here, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I think kneeling on your knees is probably for many people is, would get a bit painful after 30 minutes. But uh, sort of sitting on your on your heels in that kneeling <coughs> position is a very natural posture. Yes, thank you. I should have mentioned that. So that's one meaning of it: your practice. Another meaning of the cell is your location. Father John recommends, as a very practical, domestic uh, piece of advice, try and meditate uh, in the same place and at the same time every day, uh, as much as you can. Um, and the reason for this is that we are creatures of habit. Uh, we 
gives us a sense of security. It means we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to recreate a sacred space all the time. And uh, even when you're traveling, uh, when you sit in your hotel room or a friend's room or somewhere to meditate, there's a sense of connection with your home base of your physical uh, corner of the room at home or the foot of the bed or if you have a larger house and you have a spare room <coughs> and set aside for meditation, uh, all the better. And it's, this gives us a sense of, of, uh, of being uh, inserted physically into the universe, really, through our spiritual practice. Um, the GPS um, technology uh, works, uh, as far as I know, by sending signals to two satellites revolving around the Earth, and then these two or maybe more signals, I don't know, um, meet or do something. And, uh, and then it, uh, it locates you, it knows where you are, and it will tell you where you are, like a business consultant, just to, to tell you what's obvious anyway. But sometimes it will ask, uh, can we use your present location for certain apps or programs? Can we use your present location? And of course, yeah, you wouldn't be using it unless you did want it to use your present location. Uh, but there's an affirmation there of uh, being located in your locus, in your place. So a physical, you know, that's another it's an aspect of the physical uh, nature of, the, of, of meditation. That we, the physical space we're in is important. In the Bhagavad Gita, there's a chapter which describes how the uh, practitioner uh, will go off into the forest and how he can create uh, the kind of space uh, for, his, uh, for his meditation or her meditation. So a clean space um, with certain animal skin kind of blankets or things to, to sit on which would make it waterproof. And, uh, and, and then uh, your posture. But the physical location you know, is, a, is to have a sacred space in your life whether it's a tiny corner of your room uh, or elsewhere, is part of what the cell means. Um, but there's, a, there's another aspect, I think, to that symbol of the self, which is your work, your relationships, your family, uh, really the whole web of relationships that make up your life. And these are not separate compartments. Once we've got the f foundational relationship clear, in other words, your true self, and you know what are your s false selves, or your, or what should we say, your tangential selves, <coughs> your roles, your performance, but, and these are not in conflict with your true self, they're simply ways of manifesting your true self in service of others, or relationship to others. And once you've got that clear, you know who you are, and you can uh, do the work you've got to do. And that changes certain stages in our lives, so we have to go through identity crisis every so often. And you decide, you know, shall I marry this person, shall I uh, do this job, shall I move somewhere else, shall I... Um, you know, what am I going to do when I retire? Um, so these are identity crises where the relationship between your true self and these, these manifestations of yourself uh, have to be realigned, you have to be re renewed. You're in a new chapter of your life, you can't hang on to the past. If you try to hang on to the past, then you're in for unhappiness. So. Um, but once you've got this 
foundational relationship going, you're in relationship to your true self, or the true self is in relationship to what is around you, then the web of relationships begins to naturally expand, and you see, you feel and experience yourself in relationship to others. In terms of your meditation practice, this will lead you almost inevitably into some connection with other meditators, other hermits, <laughs> other cell dwellers, and uh, with whom you will, <coughs> as we have done this week, uh, form uh, a special kind of friendship. It doesn't, it doesn't exclude or replace the other relationships or forms of friendship in our lives, of course, but uh, it is a, a unique form of friendship, this friendship that grows out of shared spiritual practice. That's community. That community then, of course, can also generate a life of its own. And it take, has a form uh, through, through the intertwining relationships of the, of the meditators. And in that community uh, is part of the wider church and can interact with the secular world and with the, with the larger world, and globally and institutionally. So, um, as soon as this foundational relationship is, is clear and is, allowed, is, is in a healthy state and can be allowed to grow when we have begun to find ourselves and be ourselves, then we can begin to see that the cell also includes our work, the work that we feel called to do the work through which we can serve the greater good. Not just our own career or ambition, but our career or ambition is itself serving uh, a bigger cause. Our ego, uh, which is necessary uh, function of our interaction in the world, our ego is not serving itself, which is what a tyrant does or a dictator does, mm -hmm. But the ego is is the is a medium of service to others. So the cell, uh, as it were, uh, ex can expand or contract according to the time of the day or according to your awareness, from being um, your own solitary heart, wherever you are, you are in your cell and your cell will teach you everything, to the physical corner of your room or the physical space of a retreat uh, in which you are um, practicing. And the environment is important because we're physical beings. To the bigger picture <coughs> of your whole life. This is a story um, from the collection of the Desert Fathers again. And remember, when we use the word monks, uh, it's only relevant if you can see yourself in that and maybe translate monks as meditators. There were three friends, serious people, who became monks. One of them chose to make peace between men who were at odds, as it is written, blessed are the peacemakers. The second chose to visit the sick. The third chose to go away to be quiet in solitude. Now the first, toiling among contentions, was not able to settle all quarrels, and overcome with weariness, he went to him who tended the sick. <laughs> and he found him also failing in spirit and unable to carry out his purpose. So the two went away to see the one who had withdrawn into the desert and they told him their troubles. They asked him to tell them how he himself was getting on. He was silent for a while. 
and then poured water into a vessel and said, look at the water. And it was murky, it was dirty. After a little while he said again, see now how clear the water has become. As they looked into the water they saw their own faces as in a mirror. Then he said to them, so it is with anyone who lives in a crowd. Because of the turbulence he does not see his sins. But when he has been quiet, above all in solitude, then he recognizes his own faults. I think it's quite a, a subtle story that. What, what do you, what does, it, what does it say to you? Is it saying that the person who went to work in reconciling people in conflict or the person who went to heal the sick were less um, virtuous than the one who went off to live in the desert? Well, but the cell was missing in the first two cases. Okay, okay yeah. So the cell is missing in the first two cases, in the, in the two active uh, people, okay? How do we know the cell was missing? Because they were tired. Yes, they got tired, and both of them got tired and burned out. Anyone here ever been burned out? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> I think if you uh, minister to others, you forget your own need to, to be ministered to all you can. If you, meet, if you minister to others? Yes, you can forget your own need to receive ministry. You can forget your own, own need to receive ministry. What does that, yeah, what, what um, is that uh, suggesting? When you feel you don't, or you, as you say, you forget your own need to receive administrations of others. I guess it's a lack of humility. Yeah. yeah. And humility means listening. Mm -hmm. Listening. A listening. Listening to oneself. Well, recognizing that we're human. Just, just yeah. recognizing we're human. Yes. That we have four selves. Yes. Sin, uh, you know, sin is a, a loaded term, and I think we don't like the word sin because it seems as if somebody's pointing a finger at us and accusing us of something and putting a guilt trip on us. But it's a very important word, really, sin, and we, because trying to we, um, to find it or understand it in its true meaning, I think we're we're doing some good for ourselves. I mean, it, it basically here, I think he's. He's not, he's not so much talking about, you know, bad things we do, but more about things we do badly. Um, ways we slip into falsehood or into inauthenticity, usually because we don't have the, the clarity or the quickness uh, to adapt, and we find ourselves then acting out of a role 
image of ourselves because we're tired. You know, it's, it's both, both of these good people, you know, who wanted to heal the sick and reconcile the divided, just got tired. They just got burned out, and they came in to the to the solitary friend. And they're all three friends. Very important that, that friendship between them. Uh, they came to this uh, solitary friend in order to be refreshed, to be renewed. And how, how, does he, uh, how does he teach them? Through symbol, a story. Yes, through, a, through, through an example. Mm. Sacramentally. A sacramental, yes. Mm. But he was silent first, wasn't he? He was silent first, yes. Mm. Silent for a while. Why was he silent for a while? Because I think there's, no be there's a complete imbalance of being in the first. It's easy to do all the time, mm. because the being was missing, so he gave any model to being. Okay. Yeah. So he, he modeled being, and it took a little time <coughs> to adjust to a new um, to a new quality of being. Yeah. I thought um, there were three aspects of the same person. Mm. Right, there are three aspects of the same person. This is not about three different lifestyles so much. Mm -hmm. Just as Martha and Mary are uh, two, the two sides of the coin of, of our self. Um, and in some ways this is, this is a more, well, it, it, it's a more, more it, it, I mean, I think it's saying the same thing as the Martha and Mary story, but somehow it gives it this extra dimension. Uh, by describing Martha, the Martha side, not not just in terms of distraction and you know, domestic uh, overload, um, but uh, Martha, Martha is a good person. Martha is that side of us that wants to do good to others, you know, wants to bring peace in the world and wants to heal the sick. But we, but. Uh, it cannot be done um, out of our own resources. We, we, we burn out, or the ego takes over. And uh, so this minute, this, um, this uh, third dimension of the of the of the cell, the, of the solitude, of, of the contemplative. Um, uh, place of renewal and refreshment is uh, needs to be connected to those other two um, manifestations. You said something to do with um, action and inaction, and good action and bad action. Mm. And the third option is pure action. Mm. In the back of our Gita also, it doesn't <coughs> say that. That um, if we're compelled to act, it's better probably not to. Um, that we do it with um, awareness mm. and detachment. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it's very much about different forms of activity, and and the hermit here, the, the hermit friend. Um, like Mary in the Martha and Mary story is a symbol of what you call pure action. And meditation, Father John uh, has a passage somewhere where he speaks about you know, meditation not as not doing, but as pure action. And pure action means an action performed uh, lovingly, carefully, attentively, uh, and without attachment to the results thereof. Mm -hmm. and that's what the Bhagavad Gita says. And it's also what the Gospel tells us to do. Uh, the story of the... Uh, well, many, many of the parables tell us the same thing. To, to, to do our work without um, attachment to the fruits of it. And let's come back to this idea of, of ministering. 
Um, the two active friends in the story are ministering to others in need. As uh, Judith said, um, their problem probably was created by or compounded by the fact that they, they neglected their own need for ministration. And when they met each other and both saw each other screwed up and uh, burned out, uh, they remembered their, their friend, or a common friend, a mutual friend, uh, and went to him who ministered uh, to them. So where do we find uh, that, that ministration? Um, remember the story of Jesus in the, in the desert? Um, he's led into the desert <coughs> after the death of John the Baptist, the beginning of his own public ministry. And before he kind of launches out, he goes into the desert for these 40 days and 40 nights where his ego is uh, tested and purified and uh, he, um, re he, he recognizes and detaches from the false selves that uh, had, well we might say almost uh, already begun to form or to tempt him. And uh, he saw through them. And that's all we have to do, really, is to see through them. And that was quite a tiring work. Um, it's a struggle. The, the cell is also, the desert, or the cell, is also a place of, uh, of struggle. There's work involved in this. And um, the, there are two great dangers uh, recognized, identified in all traditions, really, uh, for the, any spiritual journey. One is um, too much effort, trying to, where the ego takes over, tries to achieve enlightenment on its own terms, where we, we're not humble enough to accept help or accept our connectedness with others. And the other danger is uh, laziness. You can start something and then you just sort of coast. You just sort of ride the waves. Um, and your practice begins, your daily practice begins to lose this uh, clarity and and energy of commitment it just becomes a, a dull routine and so we need refreshment, we need re-stimulation, we, we need uh, a community and, and the friendship of others to renew that. So anyway, Jesus uh, has this struggle in the cell of the desert and then the angels came and ministered to him it says. And when, when do they come back and minister to him? Next. The yeah. agony in the garden? Yes, in, in Gethsemane. Uh, the, the, I think it's Mark says, uh, the devil left him for a while to return at a later date. And then the angels came and ministered to him. And the desert wisdom and the spirit of the Celtic monks is that to see you have to see your whole life in this way. It's not a six week course. Yeah, it's, it's a, this, is, this is our life, the meaning of our life. <coughs> and and it's, we're going to be relearning, learning the same, the same thing continuously, hopefully at deeper levels of subtlety and wisdom. But uh, the struggle is one story of the Desert Fathers, you know, he, he's lying on his deathbed and, and uh, his final words of encouragement to his disciples are, the struggle goes on to the end. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Okay, let's go and uh, see if we have some angels waiting to minister us in the coffee room.